Our reading today is Psalm 84 and can be found on page 595. Before we read, we're going to pray. Lord, as we hear your word read to us this morning, help us to listen carefully to it as your word to us today. Be with Kevin as he opens up your word. Amen. Psalm 84. For the director of music, according to Gitta, of the sons of Korah, a psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose way of life is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning also from me. It is always great, a great joy to return to this church, seeing old faces getting older and so many people joining this church. In case we haven't met, my name is Kevin. I used to work at this church three years ago and now we turn to Germany studying medical physics. Enough about me, let's take some holidays because this is what Psalm 8, uh, 84 is all about. And remembering what life in Oakwood is like, I guess I'm right to say that um, holidays are always much appreciated and much needed. I remember parents working long hours to provide for their family. And when they return home, the list of tasks which needs to be completed are still very long. Shopping, cleaning, picking up the children from nursery and school, then driving them to church, driving them to other sports activities. The day never seems to end. Likewise, you teenagers are not in a better position than your parents. I know that many of you are working very hard during school term. Another exam, another assignment, application for university, interviews, school concerts, and when you get home, it's time to do some homework. So it does not surprise me when after a few weeks, parents and children gather together to think about where they are going on holidays. Perhaps hiking in the Alps, swimming in the Spanish Sea, enjoying delicious food in Greece, France, or Italy, or visiting family in America and Australia. So many options, and so much needed. The writer of our Psalms does the same. He also is in need to take some holidays. Whereas most of us try to escape the UK, the Psalmist seems to go to a different place. He heard of this famous place in verse one, God's dwelling place, the place where God is at home. When Bell read verse 34 this morning, did you sense this um, longing feeling? 
Look with me, starting from verse 1 again. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. He longs to take true holidays in God's presence. What a wonderful place it is. If you read the psalm, it is like as if, as if the psalmist opens a brochure of heaven. On the first page, he sees verse 3. Sparrows finding a home, and swallows a nest for herself, where she may have her young. I mean, picture this scene, this great God, creator of the universe, of the galaxies and stars, caring for little birds. The small creatures are welcomed into God's presence. God himself invites them to draw closer to him. And the entire family is gathered together. And did you spot where they will be living from now on? It is not just anywhere, somewhere in the corner or down in the basement, but near God's altar. This, in the Old Testament, used to be the place where God's people brought their offerings to him for their sins and gave thanks for God's grace. The, old, the altar is the place where peace is made between God and us, creation and creator. No more guilt, no more sin. There's nothing which separates God from his people anymore. And the birds are allowed to make their home right next to this very place. From now on, they were constantly reminded of the fact that there is, um, there's no sin. Their sin has been paid for. And in case they're ever in danger of thinking that they might to leave this place because of their sin, they only need to look at the altar and see that the price has been paid for. They are at peace with God forever. What a beautiful place to live. And if you're sitting here thinking you cannot draw closer to God and that you do not deserve to go to heaven, then let me remind you of some of Jesus' words. In order to remind his disciples how God cares for his people, he says to them, well, look at the birds, look at the flowers, how God cares for them. And he finishes his teaching to the disciples with the words, are you not more valuable than they? We can, find, we can, we can be confident that God's grace is on us. Jesus says, if the Father cares for these little birds, how much more will he care for you? Will God not also prepare a place for you in heaven? Let us copy the birds, because they represent us, small creatures who are invited to draw closer to this great God. Likewise, the altar's only a little shadow of the cross on which Jesus died. We can look at the cross and be confident that our sins have been forgiven. In John's Gospel, we read that right now, Jesus is, pre is preparing a home for his followers. And it wouldn't surprise me if our future home is right next to the cross, so that we can also look at the cross and see our sins forgiven, and do not need to worry that we ever need to leave heaven again. And we will join in in the praise of verse 4. People not stopping praising God for his compassion, for his love, for his nature. So let's uh, look forward to taking true holidays at the cross, the place where God is at peace with his people. The psalmist is not done with his brochure of heaven yet. He turns the page and sees verse 11. For the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose way of life is blameless. On the next page, he sees the sun. Yet it is not the sun which people try to enjoy while they're leaving the UK, although having been two weeks here, I think this sentence doesn't really apply anymore. But anyway, God himself is the sun. And the New Testament underlines this truth. In the very last chapters in our Bibles, 
we read that once we get to heaven, there will be no more sun because God himself will be our sun. And like the physical sun gives life or enables life on earth, so does God give life to the people on whom he shines. God is the sun who brings light into our dark and miserable lives. The only difference between God and the physical sun is that you cannot get sunburned when you stay in God's presence for too long. In God's presence, you don't need any sun cream. On the same page, the psalmist sees a shield. Now, a shield is usually uh, used to protect yourself. In God's presence, we are secure. No more fights, no more wars between nations. John Lennon will need to change his song, Imagine, from Imagine There's No Heaven, Imagine Living Life in Peace, to Praise the Lord for His dwelling place. Praise the Lord for our shield. And as the psalmist keeps on flicking through the pages, he sees everything good, everything which is good, comes from God. God doesn't hold back. God is a gracious God, a giving God. And the Lord bestows favor and honor to his people. And all this is his future. All this is our future if we trust in Christ. This is the place where we Christians are heading to. And the psalmist thinks of this picture of heaven and reflects of his own life. He comes to the conclusion of verse 5. Read with me. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Blessed are those who are on their way to God's dwelling place. Blessed are those who have packed all their suitcases and gone into the car, train or plane or however you get into, onto, uh, to your holidays. Blessed are those who walk with God. Yet even though Christians are in, on, on their way to a glorious future, did you spot that the way to this future is not as easy as it sometimes seems it should be? On this way, God's people go through the um, valley of Baca. Now, it is not absolutely sure where, the, where this place is or what it looks like, but if you have any idea of the um, territory in Israel, then you can imagine that it is probably a dry and hot place. Hardly any water, hardly any plants which give you any shade. It is like walking through the desert. Some Bible translation um, translate this verse as the place of tears and weeping. The psalmist probably sees himself going through another exodus story. Now, when, Israel, when the Israelites left Egypt, where they used to be slaves, to go into God's presence, they also had to walk through the desert. Their path was also very difficult. And if you read the story, they always seem to complain and mourn about God. Many times they said to each other, if only we had stayed in Egypt. They preferred to live in slavery instead of walking through the desert. And even though the surroundings are not very nice, did you spot that the chain, this place is changed as God's people walk through the desert? Those who have set their hearts on pilgrimage completely transform this place. They are the reason why this place is transformed. Suddenly, this dry and isolated, isolated place becomes a place of springs. Flowers and trees start to grow. Rivers are formed. The desert is turned into Eden, a new creation. I guess often in our lives we can feel like walking through the valley of Baca, can't we? Work, school, and all the other duties we have to do in our work, they just drain our bodies out. Yet, look at God's promise in verse 6. The psalmist says that it is, um, and in these times, people will go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. This is the place where God used to dwell in, in, um, in the New Testament, just after the, um, the Israelites left Egypt. God promises that um, everyone will arrive at this place. No one will be left behind. 
everyone who starts this journey with God will arrive at his dwelling place. Some of us might be wandering in the wilderness, but will arrive in God's presence eventually. I mean, it took the Israelites about 40 years to go and um, be at God's dwelling place. According to Google Map, it should have only taken them about seven days. Maybe if you consider all the livestock they took with them, maybe a month. But for them, it took 40 years, 40 years walking through the desert. And yet, throughout Exodus, we see God again and again sustaining his people as they grumble, being patient with them, as they constantly ask, are we there yet? I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. Reading this again reminds me of Jesus' own words. He says in John's Gospel, and this, uh, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I will shall lose none of those who has, uh, he, he who has given to me, but raise them up on the last day. And I guess this also explains um, the, this little prayer in the middle of our psalm, in verse 8 and 9. At first glance, this, psalm, uh, this prayer doesn't really fit into the psalm because the whole psalm is about God's dwelling place and the journey towards God's dwelling place. And suddenly, in the middle of the psalm, um, the psalmist stops and starts praying for God's anointed one. And as strange as it seems at first, it is actually the key of the whole psalm. Only if God looks after his shield, God, uh, the shield of Israel, then people will make, will make it to God's dwelling place. Only if God looks after Jesus and uh, protects him, raises him up from the death, then we can enter God's dwelling place. It is only through Jesus through whom we can enter true holidays and enjoy these true holidays. Or as a popular um, Sunday school song puts it, with Christ in the boat, we are safe in the storm as we are sailing home. And it's only through Jesus that this place of Baca is turned into a place of spring. Why? Because Jesus says that I am the living water. I am the bread of life. He is the one who sustains us. He is the one through whom we truly go from strength to strength. So often in our Western world, we think that in order to live a joyful life, um, we need to live in an Eden 2.0, chilling on the beach and do not need to worry about anything. And yet the Bible distinguished between our circumstances and our joy in life. It is possible to get exhausted at work or for many teenagers at school and still have joy in your life. What we need are to take holidays in Christ. Whatever the Baca Valley might be in your lives, Jesus turns it into, the, into a place of spring. God's presence, uh, God's presence is the place where we need to be. There's no other alternative. Even if we stayed there just for one day or are just a doorkeeper at the house of our God, it would be far better than spending a thousand years in Spain, Greece, Italy, or anywhere else in this world. Does this sound attracting to you? Does this stir up the same emotions of the psalmist? If you are sitting here feeling exhausted from your work, of your teenagers from school, when school starts in a few weeks' time, or if you are bereaved or sad, then come into God's presence. Remember Jesus' words, which we heard during the confirmation service. Jesus invited the teenagers and all of us with the words, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. A married friend once said to me, the best time in my life is when I bring my, bed, my, my, my kids to bed and spend some time with my wife reading the Bible and praying. They enjoy and um, uh, find peace when they come to God, into God's presence. 
So it is not necessary to go on a fancy holiday to get some rest somewhere else, but we need to come to God and God's presence. Our hearts find rest wherever God's presence is. One day we will enjoy his ultimate presence, and even today, through the Holy Spirit, we can enjoy God's presence today and find rest in him. Now listen carefully, the following words I'm only going to say once. This is the true saying and full of acceptance. It is better to take holidays with God than taking holidays in Germany. <laughs> I know it is shocking words, but it is true. There's no better place to take, to, to take some rest and to recharge your batteries than in God's presence. Now let me finish with some of Rich's words, which he always said to me when I went on holidays. He said to me, remember to take Jesus with you. Taking holidays doesn't mean you take holidays from God. And at this point, I want to greet the old Ritz and Franz and everyone else who is not here. And I hope that you have packed Jesus into your suitcase. So let us take true holidays through and with Christ. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the psalm. We do thank you for, this, for your dwelling place. We do thank you for Jesus, the way to, through whom we can get to this dwelling place. Thank you for the Holy Spirit living in us and helping us to draw closer to you. And Father, we long for this dwelling place. We long to be close to you, one day physically in your presence and now in spirit. So Father, do help us to take true holidays in you. When we feel exhausted at work or from work, from school, would we remember to come to you and take rest in you, Lord. Amen.